Hi, I'm Ramit Sahani. I'm a technical lead at Tower Research Capital and a research group lead at Midas at IIIT Delhi. I'm a machine learning researcher and I've been doing research in the fields of natural language processing and artificial intelligence in the last three years. Over the span of these three years, I've come to learn more about what is research and specifically what is a research paper. In this video, I'd like to go over specifically what is a research paper, what does it constitute of, and most importantly, how does one go about writing a research paper? That being said, I'll start describing briefly what exactly goes into a research paper and what does one look like. Talking about research papers, one of the things that's helped me often is known as Google Scholar. This is a repository where you can go and see multiple different papers. You can read papers, see who has published these papers, how many times they've been cited, what years they came up on and everything. This is a good way of getting into research papers and my personal suggestion as well as my own experience has been based on reading multiple such research papers. Over here, you see my specific profile, which lists some of the papers that I've had published year over year with several of the authors that I've published such work with. Without getting into too much detail here, I think it becomes important to look at what does such a research paper look like. So here's one of my research papers that was presented at a natural language processing conference uh, earlier in 2020. The key idea of a research paper is to succinctly present some novel ideas or some new improvements in methods that already exist for solving some new kind of problem. The idea of a research paper is different from that of a project report where one would maybe repeat experiments that have already been done, but rather with a research paper, one needs to publish new findings that would further the community. Specifically, a research paper then consists of a certain title, which is a brief summary of what the research paper is about. The authors and their affiliations of who have contributed to this research paper. Being an author on such research papers is a good way of showing that you're capable of doing independent research or in groups, as well as contributing to novel open problems in the world. Research papers then often include an abstract. The abstract is a good short summary of what the research paper constitutes. In this paper specifically, we look at using historical data to predict a person's suicide on social media. The idea here is social media often has many people exhibiting suicide ideation, thoughts of suicide. And what we're trying to do with this research paper is take one step ahead in showing how neural networks can be used to improve prediction of suicide ideation on Twitter. Often research papers after an abstract consist of an introduction. The introduction and the key idea here is mostly to emphasize and motivate why we want to solve this problem. A pattern I like to follow in such research papers is first explain why is the certain problem that we're tackling important. In the case of suicide, we've discussed some certain statistics on why we need to study it in general, as well as why we need to study it on social media. Often introductions can have figures which are a good, easy way of introducing the reader to understand most of what the research paper is about or the crux of the problem that we're trying to solve. In a sense, an interesting thing that I've learned and seen over the years is that maybe 100,000 people read your research paper title, maybe 10% of that read the abstract. Even a smaller 10% of that fraction is the one that reads your introduction. And the tiniest portion actually goes through the entire paper. So it becomes increasingly important to have a strong abstract and introduction that can motivate the reader to continue reading through. As you proceed ahead, another interesting section that research papers often consists of is known as related work. The idea of related work here is to contextualize where does your work stand with respect to other work. For example, what has been done in suicide ideation already? Why is the work done in this paper important? And why can't it be done by existing methods? So the key idea of related work is to contextualize where your work stands and motivate to people who read the paper that this method is something that brings a new contribution to the world. Often after the related work comes one of the most important sections, which is known as the methodology. The idea of the methodology is to summarize your algorithms, your neural network models, the problems you're solving and mathematically define what you're trying to do. In our specific case, you'll often see that methodology includes heavier mathematical notations, includes diagrams that helps explaining what is being done in this paper. So the methodology is often a section that takes a long time to write where we need to go through several iterations, making sure that not only does the mathematical aspect tie out, but also formally follows all conventions and is easy to understand. With research papers, although we often have great ideas, it's very important to also make sure that these ideas work in the real world settings. Often for this, we need to do experiments. And with how fast machine learning and AI has advanced, it becomes easy to do these experiments on repositories like uh, Google Collab, Kaggle, etc. Experiments often involve real world data sets. In our case, we look at a 
data set back from 2019 on suicide ideation detection and solve a classification task on predicting if users are suicidal or non-suicidal based on their tweets. Experimentation or experiment sections often involve descriptions of such data sets. For example, how many data samples were there? What was the data set imbalance? Where did this data set come from? What kind of pre-processing was done on such a data set, et cetera. Speaking to my earlier point, an interesting part of research papers is to demonstrate that your method works, but also how well does it work in comparison to other research that has been published. For example, in this part of baseline methods, I compare our new proposed approach with a paper of mine back from 2018. The idea here is to establish quantitatively and qualitatively on why the certain approach in the paper works better and how much better is it. Do we actually need this to be in a paper or is this something that the community can live without? The key idea I like to always think about before I publish a research paper or submit a research paper is to make sure that whatever we're presenting contributes positively to the world and brings new insights to the topic that's being studied. Once the settings, method, related work, and reasons on why this work is being done has been contextualized, the most important part comes on summarizing how well does the model do. For example, in our case, comparative performance can be summarized through tables, bar plots, which all summarize based on different metrics, how our model compares to other existing models. An example here is one of these baselines from 2018 performs or gets an accuracy of only 55%, but our latest model gets an accuracy of around 85%. Presenting these results in such a manner is an important step in terms of convincing readers, as well as people that the problem we're trying to solve with this complex method will add certain value. Results can often be in several different dimensions where we can do comparisons across the model within different components of the model do analysis over time, and also qualitatively look at some samples. For example, here we study certain users, see what kind of tweets they've made, and then analyze what kind of embeddings have been generated and see how different models perform. In short, the results section is a good way of convincing reviewers as well as people who would read this research paper that this research makes a certain contribution and this is how well the proposed model works. Talking further in terms of the kind of aspects and parts of a research paper, usually we often have a discussion or a conclusion section which talks more about the practical implications, ethical considerations, if any, and concludes on how such a paper would contribute to the real world. At the end of a research paper, after conclusion, we often have acknowledgements, and at the end, we have references. The key idea of any research is to build on existing research, and often with references, we tie out to earlier published research papers and see how they compare to our method or see what we can add to our paper based on the findings made by these research papers. In short, a research paper is a document of varying length. I've seen research papers go all the way from two pages, such as student papers or extended abstracts, all the way to over hundreds of pages, such as a research paper about uh, the common Python library NumPy. In short, research papers are a good way of summarizing why we need to solve a certain problem, give a background on why this problem is being solved, say how we have specifically solved this problem, and at the end of the day, convince through experiments and results that our method produces ABC list of contributions and that's why this paper would be a good resource for the community to come ahead. The process of publishing such research papers is a different aspect. Specifically, research papers can be published in conferences as well as journals. Often we submit a research paper anonymously. This is known as a double blind submission where we make a submission. We have reviewers who don't know who, what our identity is and we don't know the identity of the reviewers. These reviewers often are experts in the fields and match to these papers based on their own prior experience. At this point, Reviewers then anonymously review the paper, identify strengths and weaknesses, and give feedback on how the paper can be improved. At this point, there are multiple different outcomes that can come out. The paper could directly be accepted, it could be rejected, there could be revisions suggested. Ultimately, if a paper is accepted, the paper is often published, as you see the paper on my screen right now, in a certain conference proceedings or in journals, and is also presented. The key idea of getting such a research paper is then to build a repository of the kind of work that you publish, as well as communicate with different people on your key ideas, contribute to a field, and most importantly, network and talk to people who work in similar research areas collectively to make the world a better place. In short, research papers have been a good way of allowing beginners to step into the world of research, first by reading, then by experimenting, and finally by writing their own research papers. Personally, I feel research papers have been something that have helped me drastically build on research in my career experience, and I hope that through this video, there's a greater interest in how one publishes research papers, the brief understanding and logistics involved, as well as what are research papers. That being said, I am Ramit Sahani. I can be contacted through LinkedIn, 
or it can be contacted in general. In case you want to talk about research, research papers, feel free to hit me up and I'm happy to chat. Thank you for your time. Bye-bye.